On today's episode of I Believe Now What, we are doing a testimonial interview with a man who was born at the end of World War II, grew up in a Catholic by tradition family, had to experience an alcoholic father, divorced parents in a time where divorce just really wasn't all that common, all that to get drafted into the army during the Vietnam War, and how God took him through that and eventually brought him to saving faith, and not just saving faith with himself, but getting the joy and sometimes the intimidating experience of having to share that with the entire family. Well, without further delay, we're going to go ahead and get into this week's episode. I hope you enjoy. Hello, everybody. My name is Tim Perko, and you're listening to I Believe. Now what? Hey, what's going on, everybody? I hope you all are having a wonderful one. I know we've been out for a little bit. We took a break around Christmas time. If you did not know, I made a major move. I moved from where I was living down in Louisiana. Now I'm all the way down, well, I guess I should say up in South Carolina. But anyways, if you heard the intro, which I'm assuming you did, uh, you know that we are doing a testimonial interview today. Now the interview's already done. I pre-recorded that beforehand uh, while I was down in Florida visiting my family. And actually the interview, if you couldn't tell by the title already, this is going to be my father. Now, a few things before we get into this. This is a story. If any of you have ever gone through, like you heard in the intro, you know, maybe you were raised in a traditional or Catholic by tradition family. You've experienced divorce. You've gone through some tough times. Maybe you're like me and you're in the military or you've ever had the burden or the fear of having to share the gospel with your family. You're not ashamed of it, but you're you're kind of nervous about sharing the gospel with a family who was not raised that way, and the, the fear of rejection and all these different things that come out. Now, in this interview, I, I will say that my father, he is around 76 years old right now, uh, at least at the date of the recording, and his memory is getting a little bit harder and harder to recall things. Uh, Now, thankfully, blessedly, I have heard this testimony probably more times than I can count, and I'm actually very glad I have. have. Uh, So I was able to help kind of guide my father along through his testimony. Uh, If any of you ever had parents or know anybody, or maybe even you yourself, uh, you know, once you get into those 70s and 80s, it's getting harder and harder to try to recall things, which is all the more reason why I wanted to do this interview. One, to get it recorded down, and two, because it's an amazing testimony of how one person, essentially, and you'll see in the, in the podcast how one person gave the gospel to my mother, my mother shared it with my father, and then it spread throughout an entire extended family, and just how amazing that is. Now, without further delay, we're going to go ahead and get into the interview. I hope you enjoy. And by the way, if you have any questions, go ahead, hit us up. If you got questions for the person being interviewed, my father, you can hit us up at I Believe Now What. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and you can also email us at ibnwpodcast at gmail.com. Well, without any more delay, let's get into the interview. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of I Believe Now What? And if you hadn't heard from the intro, I have a very special guest for you today, and that is my father, Edward Perko. Go ahead and say a little bit about something about yourself, Dad. Okay. Well, I um, was born in 1945 and uh, into uh, a family in Garfield Heights, Ohio, and uh, pretty much we were traditional Catholics. Um, my parents didn't go to church. They sent us to church when I was old enough and went to catechism and um, didn't understand much of anything, but uh, <laughs> we, we went and fulfilled our obligation. Uh, and you had to go to confession when I was old enough and you confessed your sins to the priests and then you were able to take communion on a Sunday morning, and uh, that was ex- that was pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> now, for all of those listening that that don't know, because I know my dad's testimony, and we've talked about it many times. But so, as you heard, he grew up 1945, right at the end of World War II. Uh, very traditional Catholic family background. Uh, you know, son to a immigrant of. Uh, it, what Italy and Slovenia, right? That's right. Yeah, Italy and Slovenia. Grew up Catholic by tradition, uh, and this is essentially his journey and what took him from 
you know, growing up traditional Catholic, uh, being drafted into the military, getting married, living a worldly lifestyle, and then all of a sudden coming to know the gospel of Jesus Christ and how that changed not only his life, but as you'll hear, this changed the life of the entire extended family that we belong to. But with all that being said, go, go ahead and tell us a little bit more about what it was like growing up Catholic, Catholic in a Catholic background. So you said you had to go to catechism and you had to do all this stuff in order to receive communion before you can get into the church. Uh, talk a little bit about that. How was that as a kid growing up in that? Did you understand what you were doing? Not really. No, no, we didn't understand. Uh, you know, we went to uh, catechism. We had a nun who was a teacher. I wasn't really very interested. Uh, my parents wanted me to go. So um, as a very young guy, we, you know, we we attended the, that for a while. And then, of course, um my mom wanted us to go to church. They didn't go to church, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, they sent us. So I really didn't understand anything uh, about it other than what we were told that we had to do. Now, I, I remember you telling me a story. I don't know if you remember it or not. You said one day you and your buddies had a, a question about the Bible, and you went to the father or the priest to ask, and he said, oh, don't read your Bible. You know, let us explain that to you. Is oh. that true? <laughs> yeah, you know, they, uh, you know, you had, you, as a Catholic, you know, you weren't encouraged to study your Bible because you were, anybody that's Catholic or was Catholic and has a Catholic Bible, they have all kinds of things put in there beside the, uh, the Bible as we understand it in the King James Version today. Yeah, and you're referring specifically to the Apocrypha that's placed inside there, uh, books that were added. For anybody's reference, I've talked about the Apocrypha before. These were books that were essentially added onto the Bible around the 1500s, just after the Reformation. And in fact, it was a response, many believe, to the Reformation, because Martin Luther was you know, claiming that the just shall live by faith, quoting out of the book of Romans, that, that very passage that changed his life, uh, where he went forth then on October 31st, nailed up the 95 theses on the wall of that church in Germany. Uh, and then from there on, everything was changed. And, in a, you know, this kind of caught fire. And then after that, uh, in a, as a response to the Protestant Reformation, uh, the Catholic Church then adopted the Apocrypha into their Bible. Now, if there are any Catholics out there listening and they're highly offended by that, I mean, by all means, please reach out to us and we can talk about it some more. But essentially, that's what history shows us, at least all the history that I've ever read on it. Now, so you growing up in a mostly traditional Catholic, bad, you, so you said your parents would take you to church or at least drop you off there, but they never... Yeah, they we never were close going. enough where we could... Uh, walk to church when I was a little older, but you know, <clears throat> we didn't attend church on a regular basis, and my parents obviously didn't go to church. Um, and uh, that was that was pretty much that. I wasn't very interested, to be honest with you. Uh, anybody that was Catholic understands what the Catholic Mass was like, and uh, it's. You didn't learn anything there, <laughs> yeah. and then, or if you did, it was very little. So, but it was all based on a Catholic tradition. So, coupled in with that, and then uh, I know this might get a little personal, but how you grew up as a child and the the stuff that you know you've told me. You said your your dad, my grandfather. You know, he was very heavily into alcohol. Yes, um, yeah. It was a very chaotic life at home. Yes, basically, my uh, my grandfather uh, was um, lived. There was a bar on the corner. He used to go down and walk to the bar, and you know, and he would he would come home drunk. And uh, uh, my dad was raised in that environment, and my dad was a pretty heavy drinker um, when he married my mom, and. Uh, and you so, were all young when this was going on, right? Yeah, we were, you know, we were kids that we just expected this is part of life, you know. Uh, didn't really uh, uh, get into anything about the Lord. And uh, 
salvation, really didn't understand anything, wasn't really pushed to understand anything about it, though. So from that point on, uh, so I, I got drafted into the Army. Yeah, so I was going to say, so you graduated in 1963 yes. from Garfield Heights High School. Right. Really good wrestler, by the way, if anybody wanted to know. Good wrestler. You graduated, and you were drafted into the army and there's a little story behind that go ahead and tell that story about uh nani my grandmother your mother and what happened with that draft letter oh she hid it (laughs) (laughs) yeah she didn't want me to go to the service she hid the draft notice and uh i found it and um uh, the the rest is history and this is for vietnam (laughs) for anybody that might not know the timetables here this is 1963 the vietnam war was just kicking off and you got drafted what around 64 yes yeah 1964 right at the very beginning of the war uh when things were really gonna you know start start starting to heat up uh so talk about that is that is that the reason why you initially started thinking maybe thinking about god because you know people were you know sad to say people were dying over there yeah i i think you know, from what I can remember, that's when I initially started seriously thinking about, you know, what I started listening to, um, oh, I started listening to the radio, even in the service, and, um, you know, there was this guy called Garner Ted Armstrong, <laughs> and the world tomorrow. Yeah, but, which, uh, which we then realize now, it was probably some bad theology, yeah. but... It was very interesting, yeah. Um you know, and I had no other uh, no other associations in terms. I never went to the uh, went to the church when I was in service. At that point in time, you know, I just had no interest. At I mean, all. and that that's the epitome of God taking something that's used for you know evil in a way because that He preached a false doctrine, and we can get talk about that later on. Yeah, if nobody's familiar with it, but uh, uh, essentially, God taking that and turning that into what eventually years down the road would turn into a saving faith, you know, piquing your curiosity. So you got drafted, you started thinking about the Bible. Did you ever pray at all during that time? Uh, You know, to be honest with you, I'm sure I did. Um, Matter of fact, I I know I did, and there were times. But I had, uh, I was seeking then, you know, Mm -hmm. we thought, hey, we could, uh, you know, my friends guys that i went to the service with you know they were getting called up and you know they would be going to vietnam and i was very fortunate in that i was in a special weapons unit and um uh, for some reason never you know it was never called to go but i remember that people would fall out and uh in the morning and Certain individuals would be called called out, and uh, they were they were going, and that's how it went. You never know if it was going to be you or not. But I, I did uh, I did find out that um, with I was in the special weapons unit, which they had a uh, down at Fort Hood, correct? Fort, Fort Hood, Hood, Texas. Yes. So at that point, there this um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, this huge cannon. <laughs> yeah, howitzer. Howitzer, thank you. Shot, uh, uh, you know, shot an, actually a nuclear round. Um, yeah, we call it we call it atomic Annie in the in oh, the artillery oh, world. That was the nickname <laughs> for it. Yeah, it was really interesting. If you guys ever get bored, check out the history. It was made somewhere in the 50s when they were doing all those nuclear experiments and they wanted to shoot a, a, a cannon, pretty much, that had nuclear yeah. capabilities. It never shot... In combat, obviously, no, no. but it was uh, according. Uh, I did some research on it, and I think when you were there doing it, it was around right around the downturn of it when it was starting to get phased out. Right, yeah. right. We were just in a, a special weapons unit that uh, assembled this round that went into the uh, this cannon. cannon, and that's what we did. And I guess. Uh, that pretty much kept us out of uh, Vietnam. So, mm-hmm. um, long story short, you know, that could have been the Lord right there. I mean, yes, I'm very confident. Yeah. But um, 
Because you lost a lot of friends over there, friends from high school and yeah. buddies. And... I had people volunteer. Uh, <clears throat> actually, a good friend of mine uh, you know, volunteered to go because something he broke up with his girlfriend or got a dear John letter or something, and he wound up getting killed over there. So oh, it was so not a um, good time. I didn't find out about that until after Oh. Uh, yeah, and that's a that was just a sad war overall. It was a sad situation, yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, so I was very fortunate in that. Yeah, you didn't respect. run away; you stayed, even stayed. though you got to, yeah. you. You said you got the late notice. Your mother hid the letter from you. How how many days notice do you oh, remember that, that was, you had? Oh, that was terrible. <laughs> it wasn't long; a couple of days. You know, had a report. I yeah, she. Uh, I mean, she loved me. She didn't want me to go to the service. She thought, I don't know what she was thinking. But yeah. I do. what is this? So, no. oh, so uh, and the way they picked you, they, they sat down. And I remember this clearly. I don't remember a lot very clearly, but they would say Army, Navy. Just line you up in a line. Air Force, yeah, Marines. It was, uh, you know. You were lucky enough to get the army. <laughs> yeah, I mean it was really weird, but yeah. Well, look at me—you got a son who followed in your footsteps and even did <laughs> did artillery too, just like you. Who can I say? Yeah. I'm a sucker for it. But so you okay? So you lived your life in the army, got yeah. drafted. You were blessed by God. You didn't have to go to Vietnam. All right. You stayed back, and then you got out. What'd you do after you got out of the army? Well, I started uh, just a little bit. Started, you know, was thinking, hey, maybe I'd have to, might have to go to Vietnam. but some unusual thing. And so I, I knew the Bible was the word of God. I just never really read it, and I, uh, I started reading the Bible in the service, not really understanding it, not knowing the Old Testament from the New Testament. <laughs> um, that kind of got me on my way, even after I got out of the army. Um, that could have been the process, you know, like Jesus said, uh, no man can come to me lest the Father who sent me draws draw him. him yeah. Yeah, and he could be drawing you at that point uh, and acting on you to seek him out. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I was interested. I remember I was driving, uh, got a job driving over the road, trucking. Yeah, you know, cross country uh, truck driving. Yeah, this is before UPS driving. This oh. is so. I mean, this was driving all over, and I used to um, used to listen to the radio, and I, you know, there were some religious guys on there. They weren't Christians, you know. They were Garner Ten Armstrong and the World Tomorrow. It was very interesting, but you know, they never really um, talked about salvation not not the way we understand it today. But that kind of got me in, you know, it was interesting. Mm-hmm. So I used to tune it when I could find it on the radio and listen to that. And uh, that kind of got me on my way interested in Scripture, even though it was the wrong. <laughs> yeah. It was the wrong well, Like thing. you said, I mean, I, I, I've i told on uh, this podcast before, God's used people such as Joel Osteen, horrible teacher. Yeah. You know, when I was in my young 20s and I was listening to him, he almost used him in a way to show me, this isn't this isn't the right thing, right. Uh, but but it was that discernment inside. Uh, so you joined. So after the army, got out. You started cross country truck driving. Right. You started various jobs, right. uh, and then you found your way down to Florida somehow from Ohio. You went back up to Ohio after the service, and then somehow found your way down to Florida. Right? Yeah, my uh, my dad used to. Uh go to Florida on his own. My parents were divorced, and they, um, um, yeah, so he was coming down here um, to Florida, and, uh, you know, and I went with him uh, one time, and uh, we we stayed in an apartment for, you know, a month or so or something like that. And, uh, of course, I liked it. You know, it was nice. The weather was nice. And uh, Anybody was... from the uh, snowy Midwest would yeah. appreciate somewhere warm like Florida. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, you know, there was a lot of things happened in between that, just, you know, things that uh, 
that you do as a teenager, you know. But, You're living uh, a very worldly life, essentially. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, bars, yeah. drinking, whatever, girls, all that stuff. Right. And then you met somebody down here in Florida, 1972. That's right. Yes, I met my wife. Uh, didn't know it was going to be, but I, uh, I was attracted to her right off the bat. And she was staying with her grandmother. She was from a broken home, um, so there wasn't, you know, much family background there. Um, we could go into that, but you can imagine um, mm -hmm. how bro broken homes are. So, um, yeah, I asked her out, and we, you know, we started dating, and uh, the relationship grew, and we uh, eventually asked her to mail me. Yeah. And according to my mother, she says it was only three months after y'all met. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> hey, hey, it's okay. I got married after three months, too. When you know it, you know it, right? Right. Yeah. All right. So you got married. Uh, and eventually you decided to move back to Ohio, right? After you got married. Long story short is I was playing baseball down in Florida and I had an accident with my leg, so yeah, I had to go tore to the your ACL and every you yeah. got the scar. I'm looking at the scar right yeah. now. <laughs> had to go to the hospital for that, and uh, so I had to, I had time to start contemplating, you know, what my life was about, and uh, so uh, you know, F Florida, you know, didn't really present any opportunities to me. I was uh, tried out for the uh, uh, police force. I wanted to thought I'd. I forget exactly what reason, but there was a reason I didn't get accepted into the Miami Police Department. Mm. Thank goodness. Yeah. yeah <laughs> thank, God's got a plan for everything. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, long story short is uh, I was in a cast for a while and healing up. And so there was, uh, for a short time, I was working for a, uh, a, a fellow who was... Uh, we moved into an apartment. Uh, my sure. wife got a job in a uh, toy store? post office. Oh, post office. Yeah, she was working at a toy store. Yeah. After we got married, we moved to an apartment. Uh, and, yeah, so, yeah, she, uh, you know, we were good. Uh, things were going good. Um, but there was really no future there mm -hmm. for me. I was... Uh, work for a guy who cleaned roofs <laughs> and did all kinds of uh, different things so but, yeah, odd jobs and yeah whatnot. I didn't like it didn't like it but uh it was you know it was an income so um had opportunity to go back to Ohio so we we went all right so you went to Ohio and this is uh so I heard m Mom was the first person, my mother, was the first person to actually hear the gospel message get preached not too long after you got that's to true. Ohio, right? Yeah, that's true. And so she heard the gospel message. In a grocery store. In a grocery store by the name, a lady named Mrs. Mrs. Tipton. Tipton. There you go. <laughs> I, like I said, I've heard this story so many times, but I love it every time I yeah. hear it. So yeah. she hears it, and usually people would think that's crazy. You know, some yeah. person come up to you in the middle of a grocery store, or they, talk, they want to talk to you about some Jewish guy who died 2,000 years ago, yeah. you know, on a cross, and somehow that means you're saved. Uh, but mom heard it. Mom obviously responded, and we know that's the Holy Spirit at work, you yeah. know, the Holy Spirit. She came home to you. What was your response when she said, hey, I talked to a lady in the grocery store about Jesus, and what did you yeah. say to her? What I mean, it... it Perked my interest, you know, it kind of sound kind of weird to me, but, you know, I'd kind of been through this before, but, um, yeah, but you know, she was really excited about it, and she got me excited about it, and uh, we, she invited us, long story short, where she invited us to church, it was a... Uh, small uh, Bible church? Yeah, a small Kirt Kirtland, Kirtland, Kirtland Bible Baptist, it mm. was, yeah, I remember. So, um, yeah, so I talked to the, you know, we talked to the pastor and uh, basically um, led us to the Lord. That's amazing. That's, uh, that's how we got saved. You know, for some reason, it just all started to click. 
and just start all the all the stories you've heard before all the 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 reading the bible beforehand not understanding it like it all just started coming together right. in that moment you believe that was probably the time frame when you were you were you were actually regenerated into a new person yes yeah that's yep. amazing so it was. Yeah. Not too long after that now, yeah. uh, what, in about 1975, I believe, you felt a call on your life, or at least you, you, you believed you had a call on your life to, to preach the gospel, so you yeah. wanted to go to Bible college. Talk to us about that a little bit. Well... What was that like? Uh, at, at that point in time, we had our own business and everything, and uh, but uh, for some reason that... Uh, you know, God really spoke to me that, you know, I, I, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to understand the scriptures uh, deeper than I had known. And um, we, yes, we decided to uh, we talk to my pastor, who um, was a good friend of mine uh, over time. and uh, John Geyer, I believe. John Geyer, yeah. So we decided... Uh, I went to a Bible college in North was, Carolina. Oh, uh, before that. I oh, went, you uh, did before uh, that. The Maslin. Maslin Bible College. Yeah, yeah. So it was uh, it was interesting, um, but it was uh, not really what I would call. It was basically the local. Some of the local pastors were the teachers, mm. and we. Um, but for some reason, I, it wasn't clicking with me what I was learning. You know, they just uh, good good people. But um, so um, I I was actually uh, went back, decided that this was this college was not for me. Mm -hmm. It was not what I expected, and uh, went back. And uh, I'll just add this: as soon as I got back, I run into a uh, I was working at Higby's for a little while, and I run into my car broke down right at the at the mall. Oh. <laughs> and I went inside the mall to call, you know, to call a towing company, and uh, run into uh, my old boss, who was uh, when I was driving a cement mixer for for a while, and he said, "Hey, if you want your job back." So. Um, that worked out good. So I got my old job back driving the cement truck and attending Kirtland Bible Baptist. Mm -hmm. And as uh, over time, as I, I grew in the Lord, I understood, I really felt, I just felt the call. I want, I needed to learn more, understand more. And, uh, you know, it was limited at, at church. It was a very small church. And, um, Long story short is uh, I just made a commitment. We found uh, Bible College in North Carolina. North Carolina. I believe yeah. it was Piedmont Bible College. Piedmont Bible College. That was it. And it was very good. I mean, you know, it was just like going to school, except you went to the school for the Bible. And you had different <laughs> classes and uh, you had homework and tests and everything but you know you that's where we really began to grow in the lord you know i still got your uh your bible you use there oh uh, really <laughs> yeah i got all your old notes in it i love when i'm uh when i'm either doing sermon prep or i'm studying and i use it for a <laughs> for a reference just seeing your state of mind and seeing what you wrote on different scriptures and then sometimes it'll be the same thing that i'm thinking and i'm like oh that's, that's <laughs> at least i'm not alone yeah. in that <laughs> but uh, uh yeah, that was uh, it. It was good. So I went there for a couple of years at least, and uh, now at that point, you you, see, you had my oldest sister Becky, right yeah. before North Carolina, right? Your yes. first daughter, and then you had my other sister Marie down Marie. in North Carolina. Right. I can't remember the years, but I don't either. So. <laughs> I, I wasn't born. I wasn't born yet. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so yeah. We, then we were you know, we lived right on the same now, same how, <coughs> street as the church. I mean, uh, as the Bible college. Now, how tough was that? You think for uh, our my mother, uh, you know, for mom, growing up raising two girls while you're off at Bible college, probably it, wasn't making a lot of money at the time either. No. Uh, 
Yeah, um, <clears throat> it was tough on my wife. More, uh, tougher than I, I'm, I realize more now how tough it was. You're right. I could imagine that is very tough. Uh, raising two girls. Uh, what were you living in, by the way? I'm sure it wasn't some big fancy house. No, we we rented a house. It was on the same street as the Bible College, and uh, I walked to to school every day. Oh, well, that's nice at least. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was it was good. You know, it was tough times. You know, we were income was you know was tough it was tough that that's just the sacrifice you know um of a good woman of god you know doing that and supporting her husband as he's right. going through that learning the scriptures so so three years passed in north carolina you got two girls now and then yeah. after school you went back up to ohio right back, back up to, to kirtland ohio. bible back to kirtland bible right. mm. and at this point some point in time you had my my older brother nick he came along. That's right. Yeah. So Nick came along, and then where were what were you doing in the church at the time? You were associate pastor or a teaching pastor there? Uh, yeah, I you know I did morning exercises and stuff like that, but I really didn't do. Well. I'm sure I did some some teaching and stuff, but yeah, I know a, when I look through your old Bible, you have a lot of notes of uh, outlines of you know okay prayer. Okay. Uh, benediction and right. you know all this stuff you know announcements <laughs> right I usually did that and introduced the pastor you know so uh, yeah after some time at Kirtland Bible some stuff happened there uh, do you want to talk about that at all uh, I know was... it was tough but there's a lot of people out there that that have gone through a type of church hurt like that that might yeah. be able to it, we were it wasn't a big church it was a small church and it was a you know, um, it was, you know, we love the people there. <sighs> we, you don't have to go into details if yeah, you don't want. It was uh, one of the uh, elders, it was Pastor and me and uh, this this other guy. Long story short, it, it, it didn't tur turn out very good with him. Uh, there, was, there was so much stuff going on that I wasn't really aware of. But essentially, the church was ripped apart by the drama that was going on. I can understand. We don't want to put names out there with exactly went on. But there was drama that happened inside that church. Uh, and that, that affected you for a while, didn't it? Sure. Uh, you know, for... We call him a system pastor. You know, he was living in the... Uh, at, at the house behind the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there, there was some not some good stuff going on. So um, it pretty much broke the church apart. Yes, yeah, it was it wasn't it wasn't good. And then the pastor's wife, yeah, she they had somebody staying at their house trying to help, trying to help one of this this fella from the church, and somehow they infidelity happened. And, yeah, uh, just split the church up. Split the church up. No. Uh, so from that point, I you know, uh, at least talking with my mother, uh, talking with mom, she she said that really affected you in a way where you for a while just didn't even want to go back to church for a little while. Yeah, I mean that just I didn't realize anything like that could the drama because you were essentially you were still a newer Christian. You went to Bible college. Yeah. You learned all about the Lord. You learned how to exegete Scripture and to read yeah. in and to study. But you never grew up in that. Yeah, I was naive. I was naive, mm -hmm. you know. To uh, you know, I just didn't think th things like that could happen in a church environment. But, no, it's understandable, uh, and it's, it's sad because stuff like that does happen. Yeah, you know, probably more often than we know. Right. Uh, and these churches break apart, and then it hurts people. People get, you know, they, we talk about it's called church hurt today, and a lot of people call it church hurt, but it's a very real thing, and it happens, and that pretty much put a bad taste in your mouth for church for a while right yeah i it's we that's where we started our own business and now uh, i was yeah i stopped we pretty much stopped going to church because there was you just didn't know anymore it was the, after right, that drama you know. and you kind of just secluded to your own studies you were you were still raising all of us in the lord i don't think i came along just yet uh but you started up your own furniture business after that. Right. Yeah, started your furniture business, and you were 
selling furniture. Really good furniture, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we still got yeah. a lot of it around the house. So you were making furniture, uh, and then eventually we I was born. Yeah. My little sister yeah. was born. We yeah. came into the picture, and then we moved uh, to Montville, Ohio. We were living in Chesterland, Ohio. Right. We were working right across the street down there, and then we moved to Montville, Ohio. And if you've never heard of Montville, Ohio, I don't blame you. It is a very tiny uh, for everybody out there. It is a very tiny, you know, almost two mile by two mile square. Uh, if you look for it on a map in Northeast Ohio, you know, right next to Amish country, USA and all that. And uh, very tiny area, but you got a house down there. That's one of the benefits of the Army because you're able to use your VA loan to get it, right? Right. Yeah, that's right. Got yeah, the VA well, loan. Good. And then you uh, eventually, from that point, you were able to, uh, uh, we, we found a new church down there. And uh, we were able to attend from that point. Uh, Leroy, Leroy Community Chapel. Yeah, that was it. Um, now, backing up a little bit, because there was something yeah. I skipped over that I really wanted to hit up. Okay. Okay, so when you and Mom got saved, you you didn't want to just keep it to yourself, right? You wanted to tell everybody about it. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, I mean, this was eye-awakening to me. I mean, the Bible all of a sudden became... You know, God opened my heart to the truth, and uh, you know, we, you know, we just we just love the truth, love the Lord. So you told, who'd you who'd you who'd you tell first uh, about the God? Once once you guys got saved, you said you went to a Bible study down there. You got saved. Uh, how was it like going back to your family? You know, who was raised oh, yeah. traditional Catholic yeah. to your mother, yeah. to your sister, to your brother, right. and you and you talk to them about the gospel. How did they receive that? They, uh, it, it was really pretty good. I mean, they. I think they, uh, you know, my my mom and and my dad. You know, they both. You know, they weren't I, upset that you left the Catholic no, faith at no, all. Or? No, because they weren't. You know, they were raised as Catholics, but they weren't. Yeah, you know, they just were not. They did it because their family did it, and etc. But they're so. I think there's a lot of people out here listening that might be going through that. You know, they're Christians, uh, and they love their family, but maybe they don't know how to bring that to their family. Yeah. How do they bring that gospel message? So, how did you guys do it? What'd you do? Did you have a Bible study with them? Did you uh, try to invite them to church? Yes. Um, well, they were older then, you know, much older, obviously. Yeah, because um, you're the youngest. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we sh we shared the gospel with them, and I I truly believe that they, you know, accepted Christ as their savior. But uh, my grandpa, my grandfather, uh, my dad, <laughs> you know, he pa he passed away, and. Um, they weren't living together. My parents were divorced at the time, but mm -hmm. they were, uh, they associated with each other, you know. And yeah, they were was, civil. It was, they it was, were yeah, civil. it was civil. It was a little awkward, but, uh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in between there. Uh, but they... Uh, but you and Mom essentially brought the gospel, you know, to to the other parts of the family, to your sister, yeah. to your brother. Oh, oh yeah, to my, yeah, my sister Carol and, uh, yeah, my mom and my dad. And uh, as far as I know, I, I believe that they trusted Christ as their Savior and understood. Well, absolutely. And what I really wanted to say, especially for people listening out there, is if um, you can look at our family now, and we're just your typical family. You know, we have our dramas. We have our, um, you know, family issues and whatnot. But at the same time, uh, from you and mom giving the gospel to the entire family, to your sister, to your brother, to yeah, your yeah. to your mother, uh, you've affected now. I think I believe three generations of, mm. of of kids and people growing up and learning about the gospel, all because you know some woman in a grocery store right. shared the gospel with mom, and now we have you know my my cousin, your niece Kimberly is a best selling Christian author. Uh, you know you have. Your mother, she's contributed, or not your mother, your sister, you know, she's contributed to books and shared her testimony. Yeah. We've had all these uh, wonderful uh, experiences, all because, like I said, you know, somebody shared the gospel 
with mom in a grocery store parking lot and it affected an entire family. And I think something that we can all take away from that, and especially uh, you all listening, is you know, share the gospel, even if it sounds cheesy, share the gospel because you, do, <laughs> you don't know where the Lord is drawing you to and how the Lord is speaking. You know, I, I think about the parable of the sower where Jesus says, you know, the, the seeds are getting sown. We don't know what type of soil they're landing on. They could be, right. they could be landing on good soil. They could be landing on rocky soil. They could land on the road and the devil snatches it up beforehand. The fact of the matter is, is we're not the determiner of what type of soil those seeds land on, but we need to preach the gospel in order for those seeds to be sown. And it's so amazing that God would take imperfect people like us yeah. uh, and, and use us to spread his message right. that way. So if anything, you know, if any, there's anything you get out of this, don't be afraid to share the gospel because you never know how many lives and how many generations of people that will affect, you know, uh, right. because of that. Like I said, we got an author on one side of the family. You got me, you know, I do the, the podcast thing. I'm in the army now. I'm training to be a pastor eventually one day. You got my brother who's in a... Uh, the youth pastor down at another church over in Florida. You know, yeah. the whole family has been affected by this, and it's all because the Lord chose to use one woman in a grocery store to give the gospel to my mother. Well, you know, I, I, I guess I never really thought of it like that, but it is uh, it is amazing how this can can grow. And so never be ashamed if you have opportunity to share, share the word because you just don't know. Um, yeah, Romans chapter one. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, it's just it's uh, just amazing how, and we don't know how, you know how far this has gone. I mean, no, and it, and it could st and it could still bear fruit from here on out. Right. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about present day now. Uh, we've talked so much about the past and <laughs> how how we've gotten to this point. So. You obviously you, you've had five kids along the way. Yep. Uh, you've had five kids. We grew up in a great household. No, we didn't make a lot of money. No, we didn't. Uh, you know, um, grew up in the middle of the country, which I appreciate now more than ever. As a kid growing up, I kind of, you know, I would watch the TV shows of life in the city where your friends right down the street, and I get a little jealous of it. But then I look in hindsight as I'm older now, and I look back to growing up, you know, in the woods essentially. Uh, I was so appreciative of that life that I got yeah. to live. Um, uh, even though we didn't have much money and all that stuff, we were we were happy. Yeah, we were a very happy family, and we were happily raised in the Lord. And I think that's the other thing that you got to keep in mind. You know, so being a parent, trying to you know teach your kids the gospel, how is that as a parent doing that? Well, it's good. <laughs> it's a you uh yeah you you uh it's what god has put in your heart and you just you you know you teach your kids um little by little as they're growing up uh uh about the lord and i think that has uh, that has like tim saying that it has lasting effects which continue to spread more than you might even realize exactly i mean i can think back to my life uh you know because i I've, i don't think i've ever given my testimony on here maybe one day i will but you know i grew up you know that raised in the lord from you and mother you know you were very good about raising us in the lord yeah i remember you would always if we ever got into an argument or something you would always the next morning before you got to work you take a permanent marker write a bible verse and a little message on a napkin you know you leave it for me uh, and I'd read it, and I'd read it, I'd probably roll my <laughs> eyes or something like that. Uh, but those things stuck with me. You taught me how to read the Bible. You taught me the books. You had me memorize the books of the Bible when I was young. You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And you say the little rhyme as you go through. But all that stuff. And, and while me, and this is a message for the parents out there, you know, uh, there was a time in my life, you know, especially when I hit teenage, uh, early 20s, where I was living in the world, you yeah. know, I was the furthest thing from a Christian. I was the epitome of uh, Titus. I can't remember the chapter. I believe chapter one, where he says, "Those who confess Christ with their mouth but deny Him by their, their right. actions." Yeah. yeah, you know the way they live their life. That was me. Anybody asked me if I was a Christian, I'd say a hundred percent. Just don't look at me as an example. I'm not a very good one, you know. And, and it's horrible. 
And, 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 but the thing was, is when God actually, when I was in my own 20s, mid 20s, when God actually put that effectual call in my life and, and I understood the gravity of my own sin uh, and repentance truly came at that point, I had a background to fall on. I wasn't a, uh, you know, like you had. You had to try to discover and learn everything kind of on your own. But because of the foundation that you and mom laid before, I already knew how to read my Bible. I already knew the books of the Bible. I knew the gospel message. You know, I didn't have to go back and learn those basic ABCs all over again. So for any of you parents out there, and I've talked to parents before in church, they struggle with giving the gospel message to their kids and their kids are rebelling against them and they don't want to hear it as long as they're in your household. And I may, I don't have any room to speak, uh, in charge of your, you know, household for everyone out there. But as long as they're underneath that household of yours, you know, and you're in charge of them, keep giving them that gospel message, pray to the Lord for wisdom. You know, James talks about how if we pray for wisdom with no doubt inside of our heart, you know, God is faithful to grant us that wish that or not wish. That's a prayer. Sorry, bad, bad use of words there. God is faithful to grant us that. That's an answered prayer right there. Amen. Um, so pray for wisdom in that and don't give up laying that gospel foundation because yes, they may be rebellious in their teens and in their twenties, but eventually uh, you know, if God is pulling on their life, if God is drawing them to the sun, well, then they're going to have a solid foundation to rest back on. And you, you don't have to worry as much about them getting swifted up into false doctrines and false teachings that only, you know, go to tickle the ear, essentially. So I think that's one of the big lessons that we can we can get out of that because you know you raised five kids i'm sure it was there was no instruction manual <laughs> on how to do that and i know mom is responsible for a lot of that you know yeah, it was absolutely. a very traditional family you know mom raised the kids uh stayed at home while you went off to work yeah. um and it, it was but it was a good lifestyle in which we were raised in the lord and i'm very appreciative for it now because the lessons that i learned from you guys and having us go to church all the way up until you know uh being a little kid all that stuff when i when the gospel finally clicked for me it, it was a foundation laid that i was able to rest upon so i appreciate that thank you <laughs> amen, <laughs> amen. <laughs> all right so where are we now in today's world so where are we now you're you're 76 years old where are you living so we're uh we we moved from Ohio and uh, we always wanted to come back to Florida because it's warm down here. <laughs> yeah, actually, I remember Mom telling me. Uh, you might not remember, but Mom told me when you guys first got married and you were going to go back up to Ohio. Yeah. You, Mom said that you promised her that you would move down to move Florida. Back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, no, it's 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 nice, and I'm glad we did. It was a good change for us. Yeah, the Lord's really blessing you uh, uh, to able to come down here. And, uh, you know, we have uh, my aunt, my mother's sister was able to provide the means and the way to be able to come down here. So that way you guys can, you know, my mother, I haven't talked about it on here. My mother has some health issues, can't be in the cold. So uh, living down here is very good for her. Um, it's very good for the family, and it's got it's a great place for me to come, like I am right now on vacation. That's right, you know, and spend some time with my parents. I wish I lived closer. Uh, I recently just moved, and if you're wondering why we haven't had a podcast in so long, uh, it's because I essentially made that giant move. I moved from Louisiana to South Carolina. That's the military life for you. Uh, but I am now a lot closer. About cut the distance in half, actually. So I'm only about seven hours away from y'all, and I'm. So excited about that. You know? We are too. Believe yeah. me, we are too. All right. So I think that's going to be about it for this podcast. Uh, but essentially, this was my father, Ed Perko. I thank you so much, Dad, for doing this and for sharing your testimony. And uh, it's just my prayer that somebody out there is listening to this that maybe has some type of situation in there. And Absolutely. they hear this and, and it you know, it, it affects them and Amen. God's Amen. calling them and they can come to repentance and the truth and belief, uh, in him. You want to close You want to pray, pray us out? Sure. Absolutely. 
Our Father, we uh, we just thank you, Lord, for the the truth that we understand and know now. Uh, we thank you for leading us uh, along the the path of life and uh, eventually coming to the knowledge of of the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation that is in him. And we just pray for other people who may be listening and they just don't quite get their arms around and understanding. So we just pray we'd continue to work in their lives and lead them to people who, who know your word and are able to share it with them. And we thank Thank you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.